Well, I now want to talk about the three major lifestyles of life in the marine ocean. It turns out we can divide marine life, roughly speaking, into three major ways of making a living in the ocean environment. Now, these lifestyles aren't uh, set in stone, so to speak. Some organisms will exploit one or two or all of these different kinds of lifestyles, but it is useful to take a sort of way of living type of approach to classifying life in the world ocean. We have animals that we find living on the bottom of the world ocean. We call those benthic organisms, those organisms that live attached to or upon or within the bottom of the ocean. Planktonic organisms are those that are suspended in the water column. They drift, like some of your friends. Nectin are free swimming. Anything that can swim against a current is considered to be nectin. So fish and squid and um, turtles and even humans are considered nectin in the ocean. I want to emphasize that these are what we might call ecological classifications. In this sense, we're emphasizing where and how these organisms make a living. And as I said before, some organisms have multiple lifestyles. A, a sea star, for example, even though it's Typically, the, in the adult form, a benthic organism, it has a planktonic larval stage in which its larvae are suspended in the water column, drift in the water column, um, before settling down to the bottom. Let's talk a little bit about benthic organisms. The benthos are organisms that live on the seafloor. They may live permanently attached to the seafloor, like a barnacle, or they may glide along the seafloor, like a sea star. They may live in underneath the seafloor, if you think about something like worms that live in the muds. But anything that we find living in, upon, within, or between the substrates of the seafloor, whether it's uh, muds or sands or silts or clays or sediments, or even the rocky shore, those are considered benthos. Benthos, benthic organisms, can also be plants. Seaweeds are considered benthic organisms because they attach to the bottom of the ocean. They attach to the seafloor. If they live on to where you can see them, upon the seafloor, they're called epifauna. If they live within the, sea, uh, within the sediment, like a clam or a worm, they're called infauna. And I just want to mention this word. It's, again, one that you probably won't remember and one that you may never encounter again in your life, but these are just those kinds of things that you just should be exposed to if you're going to take an oceanography class, and that's the myofauna. The myofauna are one of the most diverse and abundant groups of organisms that you're going to find in the ocean. The myofauna include over 20 different phyla of organisms. And why I even mention them is because the myofauna are the kinds of things that you're going to see when you run your hands through sand at the beach. There's myofauna living in the sand. 20 different kinds of phyla, not just species. There's probably thousands of species, but little tiny organisms living in the sand at the beach. The myofauna. You probably want to be aware of that. Here's some examples of benthic organisms. Here's some sponges living on the seafloor. These are probably some kinds of uh, hydroids, some um, type of uh, either cnidarians um, that live on the bottom of the ocean. And we now move on to the plankton. Plankton are roughly translated as animals and plants, in quotes, that drift. Microorganisms that drift all the way up to large organisms that drift. They range in size then from just a few microns to several meters. One of the largest plankton is 20 meters long. That's almost 60 feet long, still a plankton. They are divided into what we call the virioplankton, so the viral plankton, bacteria plankton, plankton that are bacteria, phytoplankton, the photosynthetic microbial plankton, the zooplankton, which are the animal plankton, and the jelly plankton, which are plankton that are gelatinous, the soft forms. Usually, plankton lack any means of propulsion, though, again, here we have to kind of fudge our definitions a little bit because 
many forms of plankton, including phytoplankton, can actually migrate or steer with the currents or alter their buoyancy so that they can move upwards in the water column, several hundred meters sometimes, and downwards in the water column. So they're not completely immobile in that sense. They can alter their place in the water column. And in doing so sometimes, by altering that, they catch different currents. So an organism might rise up and catch a current that takes it in this direction, and it might lower itself down or raise itself up to catch a current in the other direction. And many times they think uh, that the larval forms of corals, for example, do this sort of change in buoyancy that allows them to ride a certain current out and another current in to find their home again. Plankton may also be permanent plankton, what we call holoplankton, or they may be temporary plankton, what we call miroplankton. These are examples of both. Copepods, as we said before, are holoplankton. They live all their life as plankton. But here we have a worm, a temporary visitor to the plankton. This might be what we call a miroplankton. And these plankton are ones that we found right off of Newport Beach. So these are our members of our local plankton. These are the kinds of organisms you swallow when you swallow seawater at the beach. Mmm. The nectin are the swimmers. These are the things that actually move against the water. Now, they may be fast or they may be slow. They may be bulky or they may be streamlined. They may actually even be cold or warm-blooded, warm but they move against the current, and so we call them nectin. They include most of the animals that we're familiar with, the squids and octopuses, the sea turtles, fishes, marine birds, which do swim and at some point, and marine mammals as well. As a result of their large size and really their meatiness, so to speak, the nectar are generally the ones that are most endangered in the ocean. We overexploit them and we are altering their habitats and it really is the nectin more than the plankton and even the benthos to some degree that are being exploited by man and that are most impacted by human activities. And here of course is an example of nectin, the fishes 